welcome to Flick Fair podcast. These podcasts are dedicated to bringing filmmakers together for a deeper and more meaningful conversation. My name is Mark W. Travis, and I'll be your host. And today we are pleased to honor an extraordinary film, a documentary called King of Beasts. And we're very, very honored to have on the line right now the two filmmakers who are co-directors and producers and We'll get into all the details of the many things they did. So uh, first, I want to introduce Tomer Almagor. Tomer, you're there. I'm right here. Great. Right. Welcome. Hey. Welcome. And Tomer is uh, with us from Los Angeles. And his co-director uh, is Nadav Harel. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, good enough. Good enough. <laughs> good. Thank you. And... Nadav is coming to us from Tel Aviv, Israel. So this is an international call. And so if there are little funny sounds in the background, just so you know that that's what it is. It's the, the world of podcasts. So welcome to the two of you. And first, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to congratulate you uh, on an extraordinary film. It's, uh, I'm just going to speak personally for a second. I just watched it a few days ago in preparation for this podcast. And... It has not left me. It, has, it, it, keeps, it keeps rumbling through my brain, through my soul, through me. It has made me angry. It has made me um, much more aware. It has made me um, an advocate for the safety of wild animals, et cetera. It's, it's an amazing film. So I, I congratulate you. And I hope this film really does well. And I hope a lot of people get to see it. So... My, my first question to the two of you, um, what inspired you to make this film? What, what was the genesis of the film? Um, should, should I take it? Yeah. You, you, you can take it. Uh, all right. Um, well, I wasn't aware that people still hunt lions. Uh, you know, I, I, I grew up on Tarzan and all these movies, like the early movies, Johnny Weissmiller, you know, but I, I wasn't aware that uh, people still hunt lions and certainly for trophies. And um, one of our producers was, was at a party in New York and he heard all about it from, uh, I suppose, a hunter. And um, he told me and, uh, you know, that was right there, you know. I, I I knew I wanted to make a film about it. I got in touch with Nadav. Uh, you know, Nadav and I have known each other for a long time, and he's a documentarian. I, I'm not really a documentarian. This is my first one. Mm. Uh, I'm I, I'm usually into narrative filmmaking. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, intuitively, organically. Both Nadav and I always felt that this movie, and maybe that's the reason why you got so enthusiastic about it, should be both documentary and kind of narrative fiction. Uh, okay, great. That's great. Uh, so, Nadav, you uh, now I understand from Tomer, you, as a directing team, your history is more in documentaries. Um, and so, Correct. So... My, besides being obviously interested in, in the subject matter, I'm curious how you, as a documentary filmmaker, approach this. And I'll just say one thing, because I'm, I've only worked on a few documentaries myself, even though I'm a director. I'm more of a narrative director. And I see doc, many different styles of documentaries. And maybe we can talk a little bit about this later. But what really intrigued me about this film is that the two of you, as documented filmmakers, literally, to me, disappeared. And it's like you weren't, you were there documenting it, but you weren't, um, I didn't feel that the, your presence or your influence on uh, the subject matter, mm -hmm. on Aaron and his, his journey and on the lion hunt. And so I felt like I was watching very something very, very authentic. So, but my question to you is, yeah. How, how, how do you as a documentary filmmaker, because I'm really curious, approach something um, uh, like this? I, I connected immediately with the subject. First of all, it, uh, it intrigued me because I'm very uh, 
interested in uh, nature and I grew up in a family of hunters and I do spear fishing myself. Uh, and I also wasn't aware of this uh, story of uh, trophy hunting of lions. I wasn't, I was surprised to know that it even existed. And then uh, I was like uh, shocked to learn about the horrible uh, situation of the animals in Africa, of the wildlife, uh, how badly the deterioration of wildlife in Africa is. And it sounded like a great adventure and very controversial kind of movie. So I was immediately very attracted to the subject. And uh, after we did, uh, quite a lot of research, read a lot of books, spoke to all the lion uh, researchers, biologists, all kind of NGOs. Uh, I was very attracted to uh, cinematically to take a, an observational approach to the subject mm -hmm. and uh, like do it more uh, verite film. And it's more a classic, uh, classic approach, uh, documentary approach. And uh, this uh, has a lot of, uh, uh, this, this decision was, uh, had a lot of uh, application or uh, how can I tell it, affected a lot, affected what we did in a lot of uh, levels including financial levels and distribution wise levels uh, because it's not uh, very common and it's not the trend now in documentary filmmaking to do observational documentaries because it's considered boring. People now are searching for uh, very big dramas and especially personal dramas and uh, to achieve that you need to do casting and to find the right type uh, the protagonist, which goes through certain dramatic uh, uh, elevations in the movie, and has to have a dramatic arc and all kind of <laughs> things, which I don't like so much personally. And actually, you know, and we chose this non-dramatic approach of just filming and not taking any position and standing on the side like a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the reason we said that is that, uh, and it, everything I'm saying is like mutual, uh, endless amount of uh, hundreds of hours of conversations with Tomer. It's not like uh, that uh, I had the uh, experience as a documentary and it uh, feel like uh, it all came for me. But uh, we decided to take the observational approach also because it is very obvious and the common knowledge in the media is that these hunters, trophy hunters are like monsters. Mm -hmm. They are the bad guys. They're obviously doing something which is very, very uh, unethical. Uh, people hate them. Uh, they are white. They, are, they have guns and they kill uh, cute creatures and everybody hates them so there was no really any need knowing that we wanted to film a hunt of a lion we didn't feel that we need to like press on that and make it even worse than it is because it is to begin with horrible mm -hmm. you understand what i'm saying yep absolutely so we and even though we didn't really know what we were getting into we still felt that this was a, a truthful way to document this story. As a lot of producers uh, on the way, because it took a few years just to raise money and to do the research and to gain partners. So a lot of producers wanted uh, to have a symmetry. They said, okay, you're bringing the bad guys, the hunters, bring also a parallel story of the good guys. Mm -hmm. somebody who's saving lions and we did a lot of research and in the end we came up with the conclusion that there is no symmetry there is different wow. people who are doing amazing uh, work and trying really hard to save animals but they are like uh, a needle in the haystack 
Is that uh, how you say this expression in English? I, I don't know. Say that again. Is there like a needle in a haystack? Oh, needle is in the there, haystack, yes. They're, what they're doing is not symmetrical to the problem. So we decided not to create like some fake symmetry between the ones who are going, doing good and do the ones who are doing and on that sense, we are, I'm very happy with the integrity of the film approach we took of like an observational film. And not to mention that we learned other things, which we, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, soon in the conversation. Fantastic, fantastic. I, I'm, I'm gonna read uh, for the listeners, I'm gonna read the opening quote, um, which was is stunning um, from the film. And this is a Zimbabwean proverb. And it says, until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And when I read that, uh, my wife and I were watching, we read that, that I mean, that, that's a powerful opening. Because um, we know right away, of course, the, the story is about hunting lions and all that, but that that proverb is really, really powerful. And the opening footage that you used, um, I don't know from about the tribe, um, the tribe of hunters hunting a, a lion, the Maasai. The Maasai, yes. And watching it, and hearing that, as I recall, hearing that as a really a cultural ritual, even a coming of age ritual. And much different than trophy hunting, which is not a coming of age ritual at all, or a, even a cu cultural ritual. So that that was very. I just wanted to read that uh, for the listeners to hear that. So my, now my question to, to the two of you, uh, as filmmakers, what did you want? What, were you hoping that the impact of this film would have on the viewers? You want to start, Tomer? I'm going to start with you. Sure, sure. Um, well, first and foremost, we, we wanted to bring the, uh, the viewers into the experience. Uh, as Nadav mentioned before, approach. Well, you know, as a narrative filmmaker, I, I see this as almost like a narrative experience. You know, the viewer is immersed in the film. The viewers, they think that they're going to watch a documentary, but within a few minutes, they're just immersed in the experience and they're going on a hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so so that that was obviously intentional and, and, and the way the film is shot and excluding us completely. Um, and, and then once, once the viewers are, are, are in it and they're experiencing, you know, just, just as, as the same way that, you know, you would watch a narrative film. I, I think you, you start identifying with, with certain characters and here they're all supposedly baddies, you know, but you're just going through their experience. You're looking at it through their eyes. Uh, and it's something so, so unusual i think to experience and watch for most people even people with uh, you know sort of flexible opinions towards trophy hunting and whatever mm -hmm. and 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 then i think the story encapsulates everything that we want to say about this phenomena whether it, it you know it's good or bad it is what it is this is the phenomena and 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 from there you like like you've mentioned you know, you mm -hmm. you're getting enraged. Mm -hmm. Are you still there? Tomer, it's difficult to hear you. Tomer, we lost you for a second. I will, can I continue Tomer's answer? Yeah, abs absolutely. We'll wait for him to come back on, but meanwhile, keep going. Yep. Okay, so you asked what was our goal when we did the movie, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, so we had, <laughs> we wanted to raise awareness among general population and decision makers 
about this phenomena called trophy hunting. Mm-hmm. But we found out that actually during these five years, six years that it took to make this movie and research it, we thought the trophy hunting to begin with was the problem of the wildlife of Africa. Mm-hmm. Oh no, the white people with the rich white people with the guns are killing all the animals. What we found out is much more complex situation. And this is what we wanted people to know, especially animal lovers and people who really care for animals. And they're not aware of what's going on. And we're fed by the media that the white hunting, trophy hunting, as, as notorious as it is, is a major problem, but it's not. The, the major problem of the wildlife of Africa is population growth. Mm-hmm. And habitat loss. And I hope so anybody who, who sees the movie comes with expectations to see something, one thing, but he learns a lot of other things like what, what we learned. And that indeed you can discuss whether trophy hunting is, uh, uh, is horrible or actually it's paradoxically conserving a lot of territories and by conserving those uh, hunting territories, uh, they argue that they are saving lives of animals and saving populations, even though they uh, harvest them, as they say, and kill a few of them. But there's one thing nobody is, is not in discussion, is that the problem of the wildlife of Africa is not the hunting, it's uh, population growth, loss of habitat of animals. When you have a country like Tanzania, which is where we shot the film, mm-hmm. uh, which every 20 years doubles its population. So now it's around 50 million. 20 mm-hmm. years ago, it was 25. And in 20 years, it will be 100 million people. And majority of these people live on very uh, on uh, agri- agriculture, very simple agriculture. Mm-hmm. which means they need land. And if the population doubles, they need a lot of land and the wild territories are shrinking. And, you know, if you uh, uh, have cattle or you make a field, uh, no animals live in this territory anymore. This is the major problem and nobody speaks about this. So... The people who are using this are the hunters who come to those quite poor countries and offer their money and support to save some of these territories for their hunting pleasures. And that's very controversial. Mm -hmm. But the sad thing is that nobody else is doing anything. There is nobody else who is offering any other solution. This is the big tragic, tragic truth of this film that it's, it shows you that if uh, the big tragedy around this film is that if you don't have money or financial, financial solution, there is no solution. Or if the nature doesn't have a financial value, if the lion has no financial value. Nobody is willing to pay for it to live. They won't exist. And there is no other uh, dogmas or uh, uh, norms or there's no other factors that will do anything about it. So, and we came from a point of view of uh, wanting to help the animals and love the animals. And we found out that there is a a lot of the... Uh, animal lover loving uh, communities are not aware and uh, they are not doing anything. You know the film uh, Lion King, yeah? Yes. So the film made like, I don't remember the numbers by now, I used to know them, but enormous profits. Right. Do you think they use these profits to save lions? To help the population of... Mm -hmm. uh, educate uh, places in Africa to save wildlife? No. Uh, So that's, you ask why we did this film. So we wanted to educate and to create 
a controversy. We hope to create a controversy and to upset people so they get to know and learn something new. So there's, this, a, bit, this, there's a bit of a there's a bit ahead. of a double there's a bit of a double standard in the in the way in the end they don't have enough resources you know to take care of a, a country the size of Tanzania you know in Botswana for example there is a great organization great plans you know but it's a much smaller country that has I think two or maybe five million people and they have you know it's 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 a big country in terms of land so you can actually protect the animals but in Tanzania like Nadav mentioned with the population growth there's just no room for the animals in, in the case of lions Half of the uh, uh, wildland population that still exists in the wild lives in uh, Tanzania, if not more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just do the math, you know, uh, uh, come in there with a lot of financial incentives and say, okay, you don't hunt anymore, but here is all this money so that you can protect your wildlife. Yeah. Right. So I, well, I have a, this, this is fascinating. Um, one one thing is, I mean, we only have about an hour to talk, and my feeling is we could talk for many hours. One one reason is there are two huge aspects of this uh, film uh, that I'd like to address. One is now we're talking about really what the film is about and the political situation or the humanitarian or lack of humanitarian situation or the politics within the country, which is fascinating. Then there's the other side, which we could talk about, which is just the filmmaking process and what you have guys and there, I know they're mixed, they're mixed together. So I will try to touch on both of those as much as we can. So I, my question to you, getting back to what you're just talking about, these discoveries that you are talking about in your process, once the two of you decided you wanted to make this film and you talked about that there were years of research and everything, how much of what you were just telling us, did you know before you started making the film and then, what did you discover that you didn't know while you were making the film? We didn't know anything. We knew that trophy hunting is like disgusting and these are horrible people which are crazy and psychopaths. And that uh, we were curious to know why are they doing it? Wow. And we discovered first of all that not all of them are psychopaths or even if they are psychopaths, that's not the story. Yeah. The story is the deterioration of wildlife and how wildlife is being managed today in the world. And we learned uh, a lot, a lot of things uh, about Africa, about poaching, about uh, uh, how to hunt lions, how to treat animals, how to drive in a jeep 14 hours with sets of flies for one month mm -hmm. in the heat. <laughs> what else did we learn? How to cut a, a buffalo. Uh, we learned very strange situations there. Also the colonialism of the film mm -hmm. that shows you suddenly this colonial situation you wouldn't uh, imagine existed in the 21st century. And you, and when you are there, it seems normal. It seems like this is the the right thing to do because uh, they are bringing them work. And uh, as a filmmaker, you won't want to like even interview the workers and ask them all kinds of questions because you're going to embarrass them because they want to do what they're doing. Right. Uh, a lot of conflicting uh, situations and a lot of controversy. And uh, and also as uh, coming from outside Africa, we, you know, you you think of Africa in very in a certain way. That when you are there, you understand these are actually not all of it is your problems. And uh, we in the West we are not responsible for everything that is going on there. There and they are responsible and manage themselves and sometimes quite well also. However, I will say when you touch on uh, colonialism, first of all, an interesting fact, colonialism goes, you know, sort of both ways. 
obviously it started from the West and from Arabians, you know, from Arabia, you know, in the way, way early centuries. But, uh, you know, now, for example, two of the white hunters that worked on this expedition and were in the movie, you know, they were from Zimbabwe. Their land was sort of colonized, confiscated by uh, uh, Mugabe. So they moved into hunting because they couldn't do agriculture anymore. Mm. So it's just a, you know, a very complex layout over there with the different countries. And you can't just judge a book by its cover here. You know, like uh, you see this controversial pictures of trophy hunters on the internet, on social media, you know, and it's immediately enraging, but you just, you know, you just got to go deep into it to understand what it really is, you know? Yeah. yeah. For, 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 example, for example, we learned that uh, about uh, seven times more lions are being uh, killed by locals as revenge for, like, uh, if a lion kills a uh, uh, cattle, then they will go and kill the lion and all the pride of lions. So mm -hmm. this is much bigger threat to the lion population than the hunting. Hmm. These are the all kind of, these things I didn't know before we went there. Wow! So there is poisoning. So essentially, you know, the the locals they they're very proud of their cattle. So if a lion goes and attacks their cattle and eats, you know, they will go and poison the water sources, the water holes. And so you won't lose just lions. You may lose a whole pride of lion, but you are also going to lose all the animals that, that use that water hole or, yeah. that, you know, birds that start eating the corpses of the lions and so forth no. and so on. So, you know, there's also the matter of poaching. No, if you... If you want you know to discuss this, it suddenly becomes like uh, politically incorrect to discuss these issues. And we see that the way the film is accepted among liberal uh, film festivals is questionable. This is questionable in what way? That it's not politically correct to discuss the uh, two issues, the poaching. Right. right. That the, to, to say that the locals actually kill more lions than the rich white uh, uh, southerners from yeah. the United States, uh, or that population growth, once you spoke of, start to talk and understand the issue of population growth and its effects on wildlife, that's also not very, doesn't, that doesn't ring a good tone with the liberal. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting because you, you mentioned earlier that uh, producers or um, maybe financiers wanted more symmetry. They wanted not only the hunter side, but the, the uh, more liberal side of those who were trying to save uh, the lions. And you decided not to do that. But it sounds like what you're talking about is a different symmetry, the symmetry with sort of within the um, the country and how the country is working and just the fact that more lions are being killed by the people who live there protecting their cattle than by the trophy hunters. And then you, yeah. then as, and as I'm listening to you, then I say, well, yeah, well, I can see why then they would not complain about the trophy hunters because the trophy hunters are actually bringing money into their community um, and hiring a lot of them and as as Aaron, the, the main trophy hunter that you follow, talks about. And oftentimes, you know, you will have a problem line. Uh, as, yeah. as we just mentioned, you know, a line will start attacking cattle. That's a problem line. So that line, you know, a hunter will, they, they will have a tag for it. And then they will someone you know, they'll give it to a hunter and that hunter can take it as a trophy. Uh, Here's the thing, you know, look, I'll come forward. I am a liberal. You know, I vote mm -hmm. for Democrats. I don't like Donald Trump, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. You know, uh, and I certainly don't like Bibi Netanyahu over there in Israel. And I, I, I think Nadav would agree on that. Uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, it, 
it's not political. It's just a matter of facts and science here. And, and I think we're witnessing in the news, even now with the pandemic, that we're, we're uh, or social media, we're, that we're losing sight of facts and science and we're all either liberals or Republicans or whatever, and we're just, you know, ignoring science and facts. So that's the problem. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious, getting back to just filmmaking, I mean, yeah. I, I mean I, first of all, this is a fascinating conversation because I'm learning so much from you guys, and I thank you for that. But I can see the frustration as you say, okay, we're going to make a film. We can't cover everything. We can't cover all of this. Or how much the questions are. I'm curious as you were making this film and as you're discovering more about what's really going on there, how much yeah. – and this, ha this has to do with documentary filmmaking as opposed to narrative filmmaking where the script is different. I mean, the documentary, there is really no script. There's sort of an idea, and you're following a, a, a group of uh, hunters for a period of time, but you're discovering other things. How much of a discussion did you have amongst yourselves or consideration should we include what we're learning, what we as the filmmakers are learning now? Should this be part of the film that we make? I want to start. I want to start here because I am the narrative filmmaker, and then I'll let Nadav go. Okay. But it's funny because I was just thinking about it a few days ago. <clears throat> you know, Nadav and I wrote a treatment because in order to raise funds and grants, we we got a, a grant from the Humane Society. We got a, a grant from uh, the Israeli uh, uh, New Fund. You know, we got some support. But in order to, to raise this uh, funding, you obviously need to write a treatment and you have to tell them what your story, what you think your story will be. Right. Right? Yep. And for sure, you know, in our treatment for a while, there was this element or component of, you know, uh, animal rights and people uh, fighting for, for nature, the symmetry that Nadav was talking about right. earlier. But after a while both he and I realized, okay, this is going to be about a hunter and the hunter is going to go to Africa and he's going to hunt the lion and we're just going to cover that. And once we rewrote our treatment and that was our treatment, when we went to Africa, you know, went to Tanzania and started following it, it magically, miraculously, even though it took, took about three days at first, didn't roll cameras so much, you know, miraculously, we got everything we needed from the story that we wrote, you know, in the treatment. It's just unfolded. Mm -hmm. So, but now, so for me, just to top that off, for me, it was like, wow, this is like a narrative filmmaking magic where everything falls into place according to the script that I wrote in right. my, you know. Anyway, I'll let Nadav go on. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, the the question that up was as you're making the film, you're discovering more about the uh, social, political, etc. dynamics of what's really going. You, you're understanding yeah. the deeper story that you plunged yourself into. And my yeah. question was, how much consideration was there for should we include more of this? Should we change? Because um, a documentary, Wait. as I say, it is. Uh. Trying to trying to find you, you're gathering information as you're shooting, and you're finding the film as you're shooting. Yeah, we, as Tomer said, we didn't change our overall structure of the film, which was follow a hunter on a hunting lion expedition. Right. But we were very open to any new information. We were able to tell through that story and the things that we learned. But I think many documentarians will agree that. If they had to do the film, a new film about the same subject, they would do it totally different. Right. So I think it's correct also here. But uh, part of the problem is regarding the symmetry is that the film is kind of, it's very, it's, it ends very sadly and it doesn't give you a lot of hope. Right. And people don't, the industry doesn't like that. They like hopeful endings. Even if it's a tragic ending, there should be somehow this hope. And it should be entertaining. So the funny thing about this movie is that people expect to see this crazy adventure in Africa. And it's all very romantic. 
and this romanticism is what draws people in in the to begin with to go and hunt lions as well like they want an adventure they want this savage africa kind of situation mm-hmm. and once you get there you realize this is not the situation on the one hand it's not totally incorrect to say that it wasn't we didn't discover a new place which is very far from everything we know but the hunting itself is like It's not what you expect. And also when you see the film, you enter this chronic of actions of how you hunt really a lion. And it's very mundane, not mundane, but there is a chronicle of events you, that has been, it's been followed for a hundred years of colonial huntings. Mm-hmm. That people do the same thing every year, every year for a hundred and so years. And This ritual continues and everything in the, is known in advance and they're doing what the, the ritual tells them to do. And in the end, they do this dance, which last year they also saw somebody do it. It's like uh, everybody's participating in this kind of weird ceremony of, uh, which is not very adventurous in the sense that they are not entering the unknown. Everything right. is very known. They are looking for the known. They are looking to, for the lion to eat this bait because they know he's going to come and eat it and not leave it. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, surprising also to see the film and see that it's not what you expected it to be. Yeah, because I, I, I was surprised at how a couple of things about what you're talking about, Nadav, is how methodical uh, the whole process was, how... It lacked danger for the hunter. Uh, mm-hmm. The hunter never seemed to be in any danger or risk. So th- you're right. There's no sort of like high drama of going out and hunting wild animals in, no, in, in the, the jungle. Dog. And and then the technology, which is all on the hunter's side, the even, even the bow and arrows that he used to actually kill the lion, uh, <clears throat> the the high powered rifles, all the technology. And you're going, you know, I mean, my wife and I were watching it. We go, you know, this lion doesn't have a chance. <laughs> you know, it's just, he's, he's trapped. And so there, yeah, you're right. There is no high drama or adventure. The sense of adventure. There is no, but this, adv- this danger lurks in the dark and you don't see it. And things can go, things can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, It's still you're stuck like a, a thousand miles from the nearest hospital mm-hmm. and you have like cobras and you when you go to sleep suddenly or we were in a situation where we were in a tent in the middle of the night and you, there is like a leopard or a, a, a lion walking in in this uh, dry grass next to you like mm-hmm. a few meters away and you're not you don't feel very safe in this moment right. Uh, wow. so it's there is a double there's dual meaning there also of the adventure personally I think me and Tom are the great adventure to film this uh, movie I mean yeah it, it, better, I, I think, better than to sit think, in the quarantine and uh, watch Netflix <laughs> <laughs> no I, th- I think this one this one was uh You know fairly safe because the people that were in it that were doing the hunt you know they've done it many many times I mean Aaron has hunted 15 lions huh. before hours before our movie but you know things can go wrong for sure I mean you're you're completely remote right okay I, w- I want to shift gears for a second so you I'm just going I'm making some assumptions here. You want to make a film, a documentary about uh, trophy hunting of lions in Africa. And you do a lot of research, but eventually it gets to the point you have to, and you decide, I think it's, I'm guessing at some point that you're going to follow um, a group of hunters um, for a period of time. And that would be sort of the structure of this story. But you have to pick the hunters you're going to follow. So I'm curious, so this is sort of a casting situation. 
how did you come to find out about Aaron and the other uh, guys that were with him? Uh, how, how did you go about, and did, were they your first choice? Were they your only choice? And what, and what were you actually looking for as you're deciding um, these are the people we're going to follow? That's a tough one. <laughs> no, Aaron wasn't. Our, Aaron wasn't our first choice. It took a long time to find someone to agree to be in front of the camera, to be comfortable in front of the mm -hmm. camera. Uh, you know, we we had another hunter before Aaron that wanted to be in the film, and it would have been a very different movie. We flew to Alabama to meet with him. We filmed him a little bit. Uh -huh. Eventually, backed out. Uh, we have to remember here that we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, high net individuals and not want to be exposed, you know, and be documented. Right. Know, to the world. Uh, and some of them just don't, you know, uh, fit the part, so to speak, as you said in casting. Uh, but we've had a few, a, quite a few hunters that backed out. We've spoken to quite a few hunters. Uh, you know, part of what we did is went on hunting forums and, you know, talked about our movie and started conversations with uh, hunters. Remember yeah. that, Nadal? Yeah, and, yeah, of course. You know, we, we, we would go to hunting conventions in Vegas, in Reno, and, and meet a lot of hunters. Uh, okay, well, Aaron... So this is really interesting. So if, if you go into one of these hunting conventions and you're looking for, you're, you're on a casting mission, how do you, um, is that Los Angeles or Israel? What, the ambulance? Okay. When, when, when you go, when you go to you. these hunt, hunting conventions, how, how do you present to these hunters the idea of what you're going to do with the hopes that some one of them or some of them will want to be in the film. Uh, the hunters, they are not they are not ashamed of what they are doing. We thought in the beginning we thought we should be like very, like uh, uh, secretive about what we want to do. Uh -huh. But it's the totally the opposite way to do it. Like once you're secretive, they feel you're like hiding something. You have another intention which you are not saying uh -huh. but if you come very clearly and say you want to show their perspective and they know that and you convince them that you're reliable and truthful then there's no problem because they think they are doing a good thing they don't think they're doing anything bad the hunters they think the hunters truly believe genuinely believe that what they are doing saves a lot of animals in africa uh -huh. i believe them you can argue that, but uh, I be, they are genuine about what their perspective is. Yeah, well, my, my feeling about Aaron watching him is, first of all, that he, it's the feeling I got was he had no problem with the cameras being there. And as I understand, he even had someone documenting, someone privately documenting him for the glorification of what he was doing. But he also seemed very... Um, open to discussing or revealing his point of view, his perspective on what he was doing and actually how he was helping the community and how much he loved the animals. So I think, I mean, the person you got was good because he was very verbal and, and very open. Having their own photographer is traditional. They, they all bring their own uh, you know, private photographer to, to make a movie about uh -huh. their hunts, right. you know, I mean, you spend, you spend so much money on the hunt, you want to have a souvenir. That's, that's how they, they see it. So they all have that. Uh, yeah. He feels comfortable in front of the camera. celebrity among other hunters, you know, when you go to conventions, you could, see some of his hunting movies on big screens in the main lobby so he's he feels comfortable in front of the camera he's also an act what he doesn't like the dove mentioned he's very proud he thinks he's uh yeah. you know so in fact he sat on a 
committee that had, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife hunters, trophy hunters, as well as uh, scientists and animal rights advocates, and they came up with the six-year rule, which is, you know, you can't you can't shoot a lion that is uh, younger than six years, and you can't, can't uh, shoot a lion that is part of a pride, and all of these things. So, you know, he's got all of this behind him and the knowledge. And so he felt very comfortable and he thought that he was promoting his uh, point of view, which he does in the movie. Mm -hmm. Many, many people feel uncomfortable near Aaron, even watching him. Mm -hmm. He's very hardcore. Yep. He doesn't, he doesn't let you in. He's very aware of the camera. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't let you into uh, all kind of his emotional life, uh, stuff like that, which might be because he doesn't think it's important for this film or whatever. But he's very, very, he, he starts the film and ends the film and it's sort of in the same spot. He doesn't go through any kind of a revolution. In that sense, he's less of a fictional character as what Tomer mentioned. Mm -hmm. We would, uh, of course, uh, love him to go through some kind of a crazy uh, realization and change his uh, perspective and learn new things and whatever but uh, he's real he's the real thing and he's hardcore and he doesn't care what people think about him and in, in that sense he's interesting yeah but he... so okay I'll, i'm gonna shift gears again there's the two of you. Thing, but we chose not to include that because it doesn't belong in this world you, you, uh, to not include what work of the movie is your, your sound your sound is breaking up tomer tomer difficult to hear you Yes, the sound is breaking up. I think we're losing him yeah. again. Sounds like he's like drowning in this digital chaos or something. <laughs> so, Nadav, <laughs> since you're still there, I'm going to ask you a question, and Toma will be back. Um, I'm curious, as co-directors, two directors putting this together, you started out working on this idea, and you did a lot of research together. But I'm curious, in production, uh, while you're there, how will you work together? How how did that work? Uh, like in terms of directing what we want to do with the film, we, we, we had a lot of time to discuss everything. Sometimes we agreed, sometimes not, but overall we got along. And Tomer did the sound recording and I did the camera work. So we had this uh, split of responsibilities. And okay. Yeah, we, it was like uh, we filmed for a month and a half. We stayed together mm -hmm. uh, 24 hours every day. Yeah. We went on a journey of, one, uh, of shooting one month and a half every day. So we got into this routine of working together and like, it was cool. And, and this is not the first time you've worked together. Uh, first time, first time. Oh, it, it is the first time. Wow. So we knew each other from high school in Israel. Oh, nice. Very nice. So another question. This goes back to being invisible. You as a filmmaker is sort of, as you said, fly on the wall. Um, and I'm watching the film and I'm watching how Aaron is responding or actually explaining his point of view. And I'm wondering, did while you were shooting, were you posing questions to them that you would knew you would t t later take the questions out so that you could be invisible? It, sometimes we like provoked conversations during dinner. If you like, there is a lot of talking while they're eating, right? Right. Yep. Exactly. So we might have provoked a question and uh, edited it out, or like provoked a certain situation. And sometimes not. So, some, yeah. some, so sometimes it was just the, the hunters. You're just capturing the hunters without provoking them. To... Yeah. Also, they knew because 
because they knew we were filming and we are, they knew we were come from a liberal point of view and they are not liberal. Yeah. So they provoked us by speaking about the subjects we, they knew that we are interested in. So, and we spend a lot of time with them. It's like almost one month every day. So in the editing, there are like uh, hundreds of conversation which were left out and we chose moments. The best moments, of course, is when it looks which are natural moments. But mm -hmm. some moments which uh, give you information we chose to include, even if it looks a bit artificial, even the, but uh, we had so much time there to spend. So it was like, imagine like you're asking uh, somebody to come for an interview of one month. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I, think, I think it was an organic process. I, I think they were genuinely interested in us as much as we were interested in them. And I feel that the first time I met Aaron in a hunting convention, you know, it felt like, oh, I needed you like myself to meet me because I want to tell my story. Mm. So, you know, I think the urge for, you know, he gets so much hate mail. You can see it in the movie, right? Yeah. You know, he gets so much hate mails and he has so many haters around the world that I think, you know, when Adav and I showed up and said, Hey, would you like to tell your story? Yeah. <laughs> he was so really excited. Yeah. Let me talk about it. You know, to right. to decide because, like Nadav mentioned, he knew that we came from a liberal point of view. Also, they knew we are from Israel, so mm -hmm. coming from Israel, you are like immediately associated with like weapons and like uh, fighting uh, all kind of patriotic wars and stuff like right. that. Right. So they gave us some kind of credit. Uh, conservatives in America quite love Israel. For different reasons mm -hmm. so we had that credit so that, okay and I have a question after the film is finished um, I'm assuming at some point Aaron saw the film and the other hunters too they've seen the film and assuming that they have what was their reaction Aaron didn't react he didn't react at all? At all. It's a big mystery. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. So you we don't... don't know. We don't know if he, I assume he finds the film respectable and honorable in the sense that we didn't turn him into this monster. And we gave him a lot of respect, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, but he didn't react. We don't understand it, actually. Wow. But that, that I mean, it's that's fascinating. That's actually fascinating. Um, and, and the other hunters that were there, the, the other two guys, they, did they, they see like, it? They saw it and liked it. They liked it. And I didn't want to start asking them to ask him and all kind of like gossip stuff. Because these are like, uh, you know, it's like uh, you need to keep your uh, line of respect here. Mm -hmm. Wow, that because that... we invested a lot of work in this movie. Uh, I would expect him to react. Yeah, I, I, I would. I would think so. I would think so. Go, going back to um, productions, uh, besides besides all the political, social, and um, economic things that you discovered, the which we discussed a little earlier, what other in terms of shooting this documentary under the harsh conditions that you were in, what um, what were some of your biggest challenges, or and what were some of your biggest discoveries, and maybe even gifts or moments of wonderful magic or something? Now looking back, it all seems kind of weirdly magical, just to be outside in the nature for one month and uh, sleep outside and live moving all the time through this bush that's a uh, sort of a certain magic even though it was kind of tough just mm -hmm. a lot of driving and uh, 
there was black magic in in uh, Vegas in, or in all kind of hotels doing the research looking for hunters in America Las Vegas is very 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 dangerous place <laughs> Tomo you remember how I saved you from the casino <laughs> yeah I have a <laughs> you sa- you saved you saved him from gambling I saved him from the slot machine <laughs> the slot <laughs> machines oh so the, the slot machines are more dangerous than the lions were yeah, it- uh, yeah. <laughs> actually to see well, the I, I get- to see the lion lions is also a magical moment to see the animals is like oh, yeah. magical for sure yeah very so okay how about because I know we're running out of time how about um I'm curious about post-production after you've done you you've been there for a month and a half you've shot everything that you've shot um, and now you're going into post-production what what was that process like and what did you discover did you have any new discoveries like we all do when we get a post-production that we have a slightly different film than we thought we had or it's more powerful in certain ways. So I'm curious to hear what that experience was like. Uh, Tomer, you want to speak about it? Tomer, I think the sound of the clicking come from your machine. There is a did, chance. Did you move back to the phone? Yes, because I couldn't, you know, hear anything on the computer. But, oh, uh, God. Yeah, the, fo- the phone is clicking. All right, I'll leave the recording and try to go back. Maybe try another phone, uh, your wife's phone or something. So, <laughs> what the, uh, the post-production, post-production was kind yeah. of, we were very excited to like finish quick the film and edit it and have a great successful the documentary and we're very hyped about the, the our ability to finally go and film this uh, shoot this film so we came back and we like stormed the editing room and uh, i edited i was the editor of the film and we did it in my apartment in tel aviv which is by the beach and we would go uh, swimming and come back uh, to edit it was a very lovely process we did it quite quickly like mm-hmm. it, it took like two or three months, I think, three months. And then everything came to a halt and we were waiting for distribution. Mm-hmm. Then starts the real game. Now you really understand what is documentary filmmaking. When you reach the distribution stage and you thought you made a wonderful documentary and you get interesting feedbacks from here and there, but then you were like uh, crushed uh, against the, the the film festival worlds and the networks and the all kind of stuff, which Tomer is uh, very good in understanding this uh, market. And and what was the distribution that you eventually got? Difficult. It took a long time to get distribution. So suddenly. Mm-hmm. You stand for one year just waiting for a distribution deal. After you were so excited and we got so enthusiastic about it, and then everything stops. Yeah, Tomer, you were about to say something. Yeah, we we got distributed by a, a company called Gravitas. They're very good with documentaries and they Distributed a lot of documentaries, but Nadav is right. The distribution playing field, the, you know, sales, film sales, it's very, very complex these days. You know, there's, as we all know, there's so much content out there, and it's not so much a matter of how, what's the quality of your film, or if your film has something to say. There are very different parameters now for for how uh, a film, you know, makes it in the marketplace. Right. Uh, so since since we have our and it's great, our, our, our listeners, um, our audience for these podcasts is mostly filmmakers, either uh, 
very accomplished filmmaker, some and some just beginning. And I, I just want to ask the two of you, what if you could have a few moments with them, what advice would you give them about making this kind of documentary? I mean, the documentary, of the I'm going to just be remind the listeners that this is a documentary that's, that follows a character or a group of characters through a series of events and that the filmmakers will document as objectively as possible. Um, so what, what, is, what is advice do you have to people who want to follow in your path? Never give up. Never surrender your ideas in front of producers, networks, and such. Mm -hmm. uh, think only about what you think would make a good film. Struggle as much as possible against anything who, who, which comes up your way. And know that you are not going to get rewarded for that. To begin with so don't expect anything do what you think is right and understand why you're doing it and hopefully your film will be interesting <laughs> would you would you say i like that you're not going to be rewarded would you say yeah. the the reward is is the film itself if you look at the film and you're pleased with what you have done that is the ultimate reward uh, for me, it's a kind of reward for sure. Yeah. Because I know that I'm, 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 how do you say it? I feel I kept my integrity in this film, and I believe I did my my part the best I could. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think. Go ahead, Tomer. I think that's that's the point. You know, I mean, you know, as far as you know, starving and stuff like that, I would express it. That, I mean, film is a collaborative. So it's not just about it. It's about the entire group, you know, including producers and everyone else. But ultimately, everyone bent together the vision of the filmmakers, for the directors in this case, or the writers, directors, whoever it is, you know. And so it's very important that the director, directors remember their vision through and through, and they make sure that they complete their vision, because that's why everyone else wanted to come on board. So I would agree with Nadav on that. And I think yes, you know, keeping your integrity it's a big deal, you know. That's that's the that, that, that's the main thing. Keeping your integrity and perseverance through and through because you're gonna get no 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 all the way until you get that yes that allows you to make your movie or to find your character or to get your distribution or all these different stages. Okay. It demands it de it demands Sorry. They know better than you what kind of film you're making. So that's that's great advice. I think that's good. I think that's great advice, even beyond just documentary filmmaking. Any kind of filmmaking, um, I know as a filmmaker, but we won't go into my stories. But there was the pain of having to give up or or uh, modify your vision of what you're doing for distribution or studio or financiers. We're coming near the end. I have one one more question to ask each of you. I'm just I'll state the question and then you can take it in whatever order you want. Either either one of you. Um, I would love to know from each of you what you're do what you're working on now or what you're working on in the future. And most importantly, think of this: if you had a magic wand. And you could wave that wand and get anything you want as a filmmaker. What would you ask for? Mm. I would ask for like uh, endless funding to do <laughs> as much as possible, whatever I want. Mm -hmm. uh, and. <laughs> 
Yeah, the, the funding is the, it's a very problematic uh, issue. You want to do films, but it's you you are dependent on huge budgets, so it's a problem. But uh, I did two documentaries ever since we finished this movie. I did two films about Hinduism in the Himalaya, mm -hmm. anthropological films. They were uh, also very hardcore kind of. Uh, observational films uh, which still have a big market as well but i think they're very interesting and it was very fascinating to make and now post corona I'm, i'm looking for myself i'm like in some limbo not knowing what to do sounds sounds great huh <laughs> i don't know you met you mentioned that apartment next to the beach and the ocean that's how that sounded good Oh yeah, I went diving today. Oh, nice, nice. So, Tom, <laughs> Tomer, for you. Uh well, after making this movie, I kind of ventured into producing, and I produced, uh, I think, three feature films. Um, but now I'm returning to my uh, roots as a director. I just wrote a crime thriller and. Uh, put together a pretty uh, notable uh, cast for it, as you call it, this cast. I can't, I can't disclose yet, but it, once the pandemic is over, so I'm going to be filming this together. And my son is uh, in it as well, so that's exciting. My son's in it, so that excites me. Uh, as far as uh, what I wish to, to have, yes, for sure, I mean, stuff, but I, I think, you know, what, what I'm learning, you know, both as a, a you know, as an all-around filmmaker, producer, writer, director, I'm, I'm learning that uh, you really have to, the, the price point, as in, like, the budget, the tag, the, the, the tag number on, on your movie to what you actually have in the package, and for the risk, that, the risk that it may sound a little commercial, you just got to think about it. Because it's an end commercial you know, endeavor. Mm -hmm. So you got to marry the two and just make a, you know, you just got to put together a project that makes sense for what it's going to cost. You know? Excellent. Excellent. You're right. Being realistic. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that's very hard for artists, you know, be realistic. No, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm not realistic. Listen, I want to thank the two of you for this. Um, if there's anything I, else. I, I think you Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, I, I think, I think uh, filmmakers are finally coming in the turn of this century to, to realize, you know, uh, every film is a startup, you know, so. It's not as hard anymore. I think filmmakers are now more like Renaissance people, yeah. you know? They have the artistic side, they have the, the, the business side. You have to have all of these elements in order to keep on making movies the way you want it and to keep your integrity. If you lose the, you know, the business side of it, you won't be making right. movies. You know, unless you have a benefactor like the, the good old days, you know, like, uh, you know, Van Gogh had, had his brother or right. something like that. But that hardly ever exists anymore, you know. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. And and to find and to find that balance between the business side and the artistic side. So you can still make the movies and tell the stories that you want to take want that you want to make. And I also, I also yeah, think, it doesn't, you, it doesn't mean you undermine. Yeah, and I also think at this time, since you brought up the virus and everything, the pandemic, this is really an important time for all of us as filmmakers and storytellers, because this, this is, this is what we're here for. We're here to tell stories to, and to help people move through crises like this, and they need us now more than, probably more than before. And so we have to keep going and keep doing what we're doing. Absolutely. So I want, I want to thank, I want to thank Sorry. the two of you. Okay, one, one of you has some more you want to say? Go ahead, I'll li listen. 
say, you know, that that's for me about the film, you know, I think the film depicts the conflict between humans and animals. And I think, you know, thinking about the pandemic, you yeah. know, potentially one of the causes is the wet market, bats, you know, pangalians, whatever it is. But the bottom line is, you know, I think the, the conflict between humans and animals is, is, is in our lives now more than ever. So it's not just this removed phenomena of trophy hunting that we can all, you know, chastise on social media or whatever. It's part of our life and we have to be very conscious about it, you know. It's part of the collapse of the, you know, uh, ecological system. And we just have to be very, very conscious. For me, I turned vegetarian in the last four months. Wow. <laughs> well done. Okay, I keep saying that we're done, but I have, I'm going to bring up three quick things to see if either of you want to discuss this, because I'm happy to. I'll bring it. They are related somewhat. One is um, the, a group called the Cons Conservation Force, and whether or not you know about them. The other is the um, practice of tanned killing, where lions are actually raised to be killed. And... The third topic is the documentary uh, by Jeff Gibbs, which is produced by Michael Moore, called The Planet of the Humans. So let's, let's start with The Planet of the Humans. Have you seen that documentary? Yes. Because I, I found similarities sort of politically between the, yours and theirs, which is, you know, trying to understand the whole corporate world and how money and privilege and things like that are actually corrupting what we believe um, in the, the case of Planet of the Humans, what we believe is the environmental protection um, movement, which is actually co-opted by the very people, we're t the corporations we're trying to stop. Yeah, I saw the film, it's very interesting. I heard also a lot of criticism about this movie that some of the information there is not very accurate and that mm -hmm. the technology is evolved. But the similarity to our film is that in the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, where is my resp personal responsibility? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what am I doing in my life? How I, what I can do in the small things of what I consume and how I manage my uh, small ecology. In that sense, it's true also to the to that film that uh, people can uh, have to ask themselves that personal question. Of uh, it's very easy to take uh, an ethical standpoint, but it's more difficult to really do something actual and not just have an opinion. Right, exactly. I mean, whether or not you want to become an activist or be active enough to try to um, do the research so you understand more deeply what is really going on. Yeah, and I heard, yeah. I heard some of the same criticisms about that film about inaccuracies, but I, my guess is, you know, every documentary can be attacked that way you know, but inaccuracies and, or slant or different biases within it. Um, this, this, this one, the planet of the humans actually obviously has a very strong bias in it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, it touches the point of the, uh, where, I where you become idealistic and your idealism sort of blinds you from the actual, uh, physical essence of things, of what is happening. Because uh, with social media, everybody has so many opinions and becoming, a, even that term activist is like, draws you away because you're as if by having an opinion or promoting ideas, you're changing the world. But actually sometimes the world doesn't change only by thoughts and ideas, but by action and... Uh, I think this relates to the two films. Yeah, and we're also dealing, especially in that film, maybe more than yours, um, with this whole thing of fake news. And 
that we can't believe anybody. And even even can you believe the people you want to believe? And this is talks discussions we have about even the news that you watch or where you get your news or where you get your information. And you right. will, you'll be drawn to those people who are speaking to what you want to believe to be true. And then you realize that may not be true at all. And in fact, the stuff that you don't want to hear maybe has truth, has some element of truth in it too. So it's, it's not as black and white as we would like it to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. An action speaks louder than words. That's that's for sure. I mean, you know, when when uh, you know when people consume their news or or react to it or, or comment on it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's what, uh, what factually is happening. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's not. You know, it doesn't doesn't really matter what you think about some article. That it doesn't matter as much, you know. It might open your mind a little bit, you know. I mean, I I, I, I read my news like anybody else, and it opens my mind to think about certain things, mm -hmm. and it gives me some facts that I didn't know about. But at the end of the day, it's gonna it, it's down to the individual and, and their you know the habit, right? You know? I mean, like uh, you know, everyone talks about uh, going back to normal. And what is going back to normal? Consuming like crazy? Yeah. I mean, that's that normal. Nor normal is like that there's going to be an onslaught of salt on all of us from every corporation. Like, you know, there's going to be a memorial day and this and this and this. Everyone's going to start consuming like insane people, stuff they don't yeah. need. Uh, yeah. With the risk of something, stuff too, but. I mean, that's part of the problem, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Re regarding cant hunting, what you said, yeah. it's a totally different subject from mm -hmm. our film. It's like right. li lions which are bred to be killed. And uh, I think it's a very ugly industry and... Uh, it's uh, it's not what our film is about. We're, our film is uh, about how we can manage the wild wild nature nature and what is the role of hunting in that sense. But uh, it relates to the film in the sense that people want to kill animals, which is very mm -hmm. odd. Yeah. And <clears throat> yeah, it's sad. Yeah. What what I what I found really personally very disturbing in your film was the number of we'll just take aaron for the moment the number of animals he killed just to create bait for the animal he wanted to kill and i'm thinking about all these animals that there was no reason for any of these animals to die um and just and so he could have the trophy he wanted to take home yeah and that's that you know it's like the, the two buffalo and then the hippopotamus and all that it goes they didn't. They 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 only needed to die so that he could have bait for the another animal that he wanted to kill. Mm -hmm. That's uh, very 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 disturbing. Okay, now now we're near the end. Now we're at the end. Um, I'm gonna. I want to thank the two of you, uh, Nadav and Tomer, for this great conversation. Uh, my apologies about the technical problems we had, but we got through them. And again, I want to congratulate you on uh, King of Beasts. And King of Beasts will be showing in the Flick Fair Festival sometime in June, I believe. I don't know the date. or the, uh, We'll find that out later. And again, I want to congratulate you and thank you for this wonderful conversation. It's been wonderful meeting you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Okay. And we, will, we have each other's emails. We will stay in touch. Okay, awesome. great. Thank you. Okay, thank you.